In this video, we're going to take on a pretty crucial topic for equity investors, and that is uh, why do stock exchanges exist? Uh, what are they for? And how do they impact your investing life? Okay, very simple example. Um, imagine, if you will, uh, you've got a big block of shares to sell this morning. So maybe you had 100,000 shares. Now you might say that's an artificially large amount. There are people out there who trade that kind of volume in companies day in, day out. You're thinking, right, I'd like to dump 100,000 shares. How am I going to do it? Now, it might just be you know someone who wants 100,000 shares, in which case I suppose you could go and haggle with them, agree a price, and get on with the trade. Uh, and in the financial markets, finding your own counterparty and doing things away from a formal stock exchange, if you like, is known as over-the-counter trading. And it's still perfectly possible. But there are some problems with it. Number one, it's not necessarily the quickest way to do a deal. Uh, you may have to spend a little bit of time looking around for your counterparty. Secondly, do you trust them? Uh, what happens if you, know, you hand over the shares and they don't pay you? Um, uh, and for them, of course, the reverse is true. What if they hand over their cash uh, and you never deliver the shares, or I never deliver the shares? Um, so you've got that kind of risk. You've also got the issue of, uh, maybe I'd prefer to do this whole thing anonymously, you know, because it's quite a big trade. I don't want word to get out through whoever this guy is I'm gonna sell to that I'm looking to dump 100,000 shares, because if enough people find out, they might actually move the price down against me. So maybe I prefer a way of doing it that doesn't sort of reveal my identity. Um, and yeah, then there's the issue of the price. Uh, I mean, basically, what price am I going to agree to sell these shares for? What do I use as a reference? You know, do I find out what lots of other people are trading shares for and use that as a reference price for my little trade? Um, or how do I go about it? Now, a lot of these problems can be solved by a stock exchange. Stock exchanges bring together lots of buyers and sellers. Originally in coffee houses, uh, if you're looking at the London market around London, but later formalized into proper buildings and of course now uh, with sophisticated IT and all the rest of it. But the principle is very simple. You're basically bringing buyers and sellers together in one central marketplace. If you bring enough of them together, you'll get reliable prices for things like shares. Because you've got lots of people trading, you can reckon that the price being struck at any one point in time is representative for something like, say, a Tesco share. And these days, exchanges, as we'll see in a moment, build in um, lots of extra features. So, for example, you can trade anonymously if you need to. Uh, and you also, uh, as a user of an exchange, get a thing called a central counterparty guarantee, which is a flash way of saying the risk of either the buyer not paying the seller or the seller not delivering the shares. Because you think about it, those two things have got to happen for a trade to work is nearly zero. Okay, so lots of reasons for exchanges to exist. How do they impact your life as an investor? Well, let's take a look at that. Okay, so imagine um, here you are um, as a, an investor. My graphics are not fabulous, as anyone who's watched my other videos will know by now. Uh, and you're looking to make a share sale. Okay, so who would you call? Well, the answer is you won't ring the London Stock Exchange. Um, these exchanges, uh, there's one in London, one in Tokyo, one in New York, one in most of the major capitals, um, are like clubs. They have members, okay? They don't want to let any old uh, sausage in. They want to make sure that only people who will honor trades and are known to them uh, join as members. And to be honest, in a cost-benefit point of view, it doesn't make any sense for a very small trader to become a member. So. Who would I phone if I'm looking to sell 50 or 100 or 200 shares this morning? And the answer is a broker. A broker will be a member of the London Stock Exchange so they can start to get things going for me. So as Tim Bennett, chances are I'm not going to have anything to do with the London Stock Exchange directly other than going on a kind of tourist tour of it. Uh, what I'm going to do is phone my broker. That's broker. And give a sell instruction. All right. Now, just worth mentioning, brokers tend to be members of these exchanges. So in London, there are lots of brokers around who are members of the London Stock Exchange. Other brokers are members of the New York, New York Stock Exchange, and so on. And um, my broker, just worth noticing, might offer me one of two or three levels of service. Um, and that's something I address in another video, um, how to choose a broker. But it might be that I'm just doing an electronic trade. 
cheap and cheerful, execution only, in which case I just tap my instruction into a keyboard and it goes straight through to my broker. Uh, and my broker, by the way, could be one of the big banks. It could be a slightly more independent broker, um, a Bruin Dolphin, for example, or a Charles Stanley. All right, but nonetheless, lots of brokers in the market. And in another video, I, I, just, I address how to choose one. But my trade could be done electronically. It may be I pick up the phone if I've got a more expensive relationship with my broker or I'm trying to trade something that's a little less popular than say Tesco shares or Vodafone. But anyway, um, have a look at my other video um, if you're interested in how to go about picking a broker. But let's say I've got one, I'm happy with whoever that is, and I issue a sell instruction. Now the point is, uh, basically in this introductory video, the broker, either directly or indirectly, will have um, a relationship with the London stock exchange, let's say, for UK shares. Now, you don't have to sell UK shares through London Stock Exchange as a broker. There are other exchanges that list UK shares, all right, but the London Stock Exchange enjoys a pretty hefty share of the market. So my broker, um, he may aggregate my order with quite a few others coming in from clients, because I'm not the only person selling today, especially if it's a popular share, and then pump an order through to the London Stock Exchange. Now, um, without going into too much detail here, what's the point? What's the role of the London Stock Exchange? Well, of course, what will be happening on the other side, let's say, is lots of investors will be pumping buy orders through their brokers for the same stock. If it's a popular stock like Tesco, Vodafone. So there'll be lots of people like me giving instructions to their broker. The broker will then be pumping orders through to the central marketplace for London Stock Exchange. So you can imagine, a whole load of buys flooding in to the central marketplace. And what is the job of the London Stock Exchange? Well, essentially, it's very straightforward. Sounds straightforward. Um, it's to match trades. So basically, the LSE tries to match as many buy and sell orders together as it can. Now, how do you do that? Just a word about that. If you go to the London Stock Exchange building, you may be disappointed insofar as it's not as exciting as going to the New York Stock Exchange. At the New York Stock Exchange, you'll see lots of people uh, seeming to kind of shout at each other a lot and a bell rings and it all looks quite exciting. At the London Stock Exchange, it's all very silent. There are not many people around in reception and frankly, everything seems quite quiet and under control, despite the fact there are millions of trades happening um, as yeah, as the day goes on. So what's going on there? How are they doing this? Well, just worth noticing that the London Stock Exchange, an awful lot of trades that are done, are matched electronically through what's called an order book. Now, I'm not gonna take on um, the structure and workings of order books um, in this video, but basically an order book simply says, well, if enough people want to buy Tesco at around two pounds, enough people want to sell Tesco at around two pounds, can't you just use the internet or a computer program to simply match those trades together? Okay, there's no need for a middleman, if you like. Um, however, it is possible on exchanges to still have deals done through um, what in the London market are known as market makers. All right, now market makers uh, won't thank me for this comparison, but they operate a little bit like second-hand car dealers, if you like. Um, imagine you're trying as a broker to offload um, a slightly less popular, less well-known stock, or you've got a particularly big order and you're not sure it's gonna clear through this electronic order book, you could approach one of the LSE's market makers. And market makers are a bit like second-hand car dealers, they match trades as well. All right, but they're a little bit more specialist, if you like. In fact, some exchanges call them specialists. So what they'll do is you contact one of these, one of these market makers. Um, they will have a book of stocks that they're prepared to buy and sell. They literally run a book, a bit like a second-hand car dealer, you, you presume, has a stock of cars. They buy at one price and they sell at another price. They buy low, just like second-hand car dealers, and they sell high because they're trying to make money, all right? Um, and essentially, brokers can put trades through these dealers, if you like, um, working on behalf of the London Stock Exchange to match trades. Because, you know, from the exchange's point of view, the more deals that get done, the better, okay? Because that uh, obviously means that the reported volume going through the exchange compared to its rivals uh, looks that bit more impressive, all right? So, 
in a nutshell, um, one of the big jobs the London Stock Exchange that says to match trades, um, a lot of them are done electronically, all right, um, and some are done in a slightly sort of more old-fashioned way um, involving market makers. But even where market makers are involved, um, again, the London Stock Exchange has an electronic system that allows you to place the trade. So in either case, you're not seeing the kind of colourful jackets and uh, shouting of orders that goes on somewhere like the New York Stock Exchange or in Chicago, for example. So just be aware that what I'm describing here isn't universal in so far as over in America. They still agree trades uh, manually, if you like, face-to-face -face with hand signals and so on. Um, but in Europe, this idea of electronic trading and electronic order matching is becoming more and more prevalent because it's fast, it's cheap, and it's totally anonymous. Okay? In other words, a broker can put an order through this order book without revealing who they are. And that can be useful if you're trying to do a big or slightly awkward trade. Now, just a few words um, about what else an exchange can offer. Um, is it just matching trades? Well, no. They can also offer a form of guarantee. So, remember that point I said about um, what happens if you're worried that whoever your counterparty to the trade is, if you're selling, whoever your buyer is, won't pay you. Obviously, if you're a buyer, the worry is that the seller won't deliver the shares they've just promised to deliver when this deal was done. All right. Um, so, to get around that, the London Stock Exchange, like other exchanges, has a relationship with an organisation called um, LCH Clearnet. Bit of a mouthful, but essentially, that contract means there is somebody out there guaranteeing that if the buyer doesn't pay, Effectively, the exchange or the clearinghouse will, and if the seller doesn't deliver shares having agreed to, then the clearinghouse will. So in other words, you can be confident as someone using the exchange that deals will be honoured. Okay? Um, so, the final point is London Stock Exchange um, has an arrangement to allow for the settlement of shares. Um, I won't go into that in any detail here because we're talking about exchanges, but there is an organisation out there called Euroclear Crest, and in a, in a nutshell, that copes with the final stage of a share transaction, which is the fact that in the UK, shares are registered, like property. Um, basically, a central electronic register has to be updated when you buy shares and updated when you sell shares, and somebody needs to do that. So to take away all that hassle, the exchange say, well, if you deal through us, that's pretty much automatically taken care of. All right, so all the sort of administration that goes at the end of a share deal, um, they effectively deal with too. And all of this costs money. So a broker will expect to pay, to use the order book at the exchange for that guarantee, for the settlement bit, and that of course is why your broker charges you to do a deal. So you know, a little bit of that 9.99 per trade, whatever you're paying, uh, is going into the broker, paying for all this lot. All right, so let's just summarize um, why exchanges exist, or two or three key points. Just recap on those, and then I'll talk about um, the kind of one big current issue that's uh, worrying exchanges at the moment. And then we'll leave it there. Uh, anyone who wants to know more about shares themselves, uh, take a look at one or two of my other videos. Um, and if you want the background of this whole video, I've done an introduction to financial markets, which covers uh, where this kind of fits in. Okay, so just to wrap up on those, on those final couple of issues. So, in a nutshell, um, what are things like the London Stock Exchange all about? Um, well, price transparency. In other words, um, if I'm planning to buy or sell shares, looking up a price at the London Stock Exchange, <coughs> by the way, the prices are quoted daily, so the closing price at the exchange around uh, 4.30 in the evening, well, just slightly near 5 o'clock being, being technical about it, um, is published, so people use that. Um, fund managers, for example, want to know at the end of the day what the closing price for, say, Tesco or Vodafone was, so they can value their portfolios accordingly. So exchanges <coughs> are a useful reference point both for 
the price that people want to do a deal at and also the price that uh, you know, fund managers and investors will, as they call it, mark their portfolios to market at the end of the day. So lots of price information from exchanges, which is very useful, uh, and also information about how many deals are getting done and all the rest of it. Uh, number two, they can provide the anonymity that some of the bigger players in the market like. All right, now there are other ways to achieve that in practice, but if you don't want to have to go out and find a counterparty over the counter, um, then exchanges offer you the ability to trade without revealing who you are. And that can be useful. It doesn't matter if you're offloading five shares, but if you're off offloading half a million, anonymity is quite important. Otherwise, people will start to move prices against you. Okay, and that's true in any market, not just for shares. Um, number three, the guarantee and settlement arrangements. Uh, the guarantee being that if you buy shares through an exchange, basically the deal will be honoured by the seller and vice versa. And settlement being the fact that shares are legally registered in the UK, so there's a bit of administration that goes with them, and an exchange can offer to cope with sort of most of that. Again, most of it's electronic in the UK market these days. Um, so, those are two or three key reasons why exchanges exist, and perhaps going back to the origins of exchanges, when dealing in shares moved out of coffee houses, regulation. In other words, only certain people are allowed to join the London Stock Exchange as members, and that hopefully imposes a degree of sort of regulation on the market. It makes it less likely that people will fail trades and so on. And failed trades, when uh, trades were done in coffee houses informally, were a big feature of the market and one that exchanges tried to kind of eliminate. Okay, <clears throat> so that gives you a, a flavour for the main reasons, or some of the main reasons, why exchanges exist. And of course, we've got exchanges all over the world now. You've got them in New York, Chicago, some of them, some of them are stock exchanges, some of them are more sort of derivatives focus. I've done some videos on derivatives for those people interested. Um, some of them focus on commodities, the exchanges in Chicago, for example. Uh, and some markets don't really have an exchange or it's not an obvious big exchange. For example, in the foreign exchange market, traders are quite happily to do deals over the counter most of the time. So in London, for example, it's quite hard to find, to put it mildly, a foreign exchange exchange. All right, where you, where you, will, you will find a London Stock Exchange. Okay? So these things have sprung up basically as demand has dictated. Now, just to close out, what's the big issue um, in the headlines around exchanges? Well, there are several. Exchanges like to advertise themselves as being you know, fast, cost efficient, offering a massive range of services. For the London Stock Exchange, will say, come to us because we offer a low cost electronic dealing platform, okay, and that's attractive to members of the exchange, for example. And um, we also offer a wide range <coughs> of different securities through the exchange for trading. And there's one of the big issues. Um, exchanges are under increasing pressure to consolidate, to merge, and become one-stop shops. That's the buzzword you'll hear at the moment. In other words, the London Stock Exchange can't just sit there, okay, complacently offering a sort of list of liquid UK stocks. People want to go there and buy international stocks. Maybe they want derivatives. Maybe they want commodities. Okay, so increasingly exchanges are merging and getting together to provide that kind of one-stop shop. And also, drive down costs. Big is generally thought to be beautiful. So in the UK market, for example, we no longer have regional exchanges in Birmingham and Manchester and so on. Years ago, they all got squished into one sort of London Stock Exchange, and now internationally, there's pressure, even on those domestic exchanges, the dominant ones, to get their act together, um, get even cheaper, move further towards electronic trading, and offer a bigger and wider range of securities to their members. And that's something you will see plenty of commentary on in the press at the moment. This video is going to talk about investment banks. They've been in the press a lot recently. There's uh, talk about banking bonuses, how big they should be, how do they afford them. So this time we're going to take a look at what investment banks actually claim to do uh, that justifies paying all that money to their star traders and so on. Okay, so where do investment banks fit in? 
Well, these days it's relatively uncommon to have an organisation that is purely an investment bank. There are some around, but many are bolted on the side of retail banks. So when you look at an organisation such as Barclays, you're actually looking at a global organisation that comprises a number of different divisions. So what you can do, quite often, is take a bank and in very simple terms, split it down into two basic functions. And there's been a lot of talk in the media recently about whether banks should do both of these functions. There's retail banking and there's investment banking. Now, it is possible to get banks that just do, do one or the other. Uh, Goldman Sachs is largely an investment bank, as is JP Morgan. But the likes of Barclays, HSBC, actually do both. They didn't always, but uh, these days they do both. So, first of all, before we look at this one, what's the difference? Well, retail banking is the bread and butter of banking in many ways. This is uh, organising mortgages and loans for retail investors, businesses and the like, and also organising savings accounts for people with spare cash. So on the one side, retail banks take money in from investors who've got capital that they want to leave safely tucked away in a bank for a while, and they also lend it out uh, to people wanting loans and mortgages. And ideally over here, in simple terms, you want to give away as a bank less to your savers than you grab from your borrowers. That way you make a profit. However, that's often seen as a little bit low risk, a little bit unsexy, albeit it's fairly safe, solid cash flow generating business. So investment banking is often perceived as the higher risk, sexy bit of the industry. And this is where the much higher margins are made. Um, there is much more money potentially in investment banking, but there are risks associated with it. So in this video, we're gonna steer away from retail banking and take a look at investment banking. And we're going to look at five basic bread and butter activities that many investment banks would claim sit at the heart of what they do and justify some of those big bonuses being paid at the moment. Whether or not they do justify the bonuses is another question for another video, but nonetheless it's these activities that tend to attract all the headlines. So what are they? Let's take a look at five. So, in investment banking, and that's where we're going to focus right now, we'll leave retail banking to one side. Uh, activity number one, prop or proprietary trading. Prop or proprietary trading. Now, just like I can take my own money out of my own bank account and gamble it on the horses, spread betting, investing in shares, property, whatever I like, investment banks can do the same. They have their own funds, they also raise money from investors of course, but they have their own funds, and those can be gambled, often in spectacular amounts, to make the bank money. So banks employ teams of traders to bet on currencies, commodities, bonds, and so forth. And if they get it right, they make money, like any good gambler would. Their aim is to employ the best gamblers in the market, if you like, and therefore outwit everybody else trying to do the same thing. And that activity, gambling the bank's money in order to make money, is known as proprietary trading. The second activity, market making. As a retail investor, or as any investor, if you want to go out and buy Tesco shares, for example, you need a market. And that market is provided by organisations such as the London Stock Exchange. But a market needs buyers and sellers, otherwise it doesn't work. So if I want to buy 10,000 Tesco shares, I need to be pretty sure that if I go to a market such as an exchange, there'll be someone willing to sell at least that many shares, otherwise there's no market. Um, I might as well just hunt around for my own seller. So market making is an important function of investment banks. What investment banks often commit to do at the London Stock Exchange is trade regularly so that other people can too. They literally make the market. A bit like if I wanted to buy a second-hand car this morning, I could run around 
trying to find an individual seller, or I could approach a second-hand car dealer. That is somebody who holds a stock of second-hand cars and is always willing to do a trade in them for my benefit as a customer or a punter. Of course, they're not a charity. They try to make money out of it, but market making at a stock exchange is another important function of an investment bank. It's often not terribly profitable, and it's not to be confused with prop trading um, because they are subject to rules about the size of bid offer spreads, and there's also quite big competition. So there might be a dozen banks all competing to make a market in a particular share at the London Stock Exchange, and that competition can narrow spreads right down. Nonetheless, quite an important function, and quite a few banks like to be seen to be acting as market makers. It's a kind of prestigious, good PR thing to do. Number three, M&A, or M&A advisory. Mergers and acquisitions. The people actually doing the deals, merging with each other or buying each other, are usually companies. Um, so you might find that um, in the airline industry, you have one company merging with another or taking over another, for example. The banks make a decent fee out of advising those companies. So a predator, as they're known, might want to buy a target. It might approach a Goldman Sachs, for example, and say, right, we need some advice. We need some advice on the timing. When should we go for the deal? We need some advice on how to structure it. Um, is it going to be a cash deal? Are we going to try and buy using something else? We need some help with the regulators. What are the documents we need to get sorted out? We need some help screening the target, due diligence as it's called, making sure we know what we're buying, and so on. We also need some help publicising it. So all of those jobs you can pass off to an investment bank and uh, they generally take a cut of the size of the deal, if you like. So the bigger the deal, the more the bank will earn. They also do something else, um, which is similar in a way, but I'm going to call corporate events. Uh, in particular, new issues. Another reason a bank might be approached by a company is it needs to raise funds. Now, it could be raising funds to fund the takeover of another company, but it might not be. Um, a company such as Tesco or Marks and Spencers might simply need to raise more capital. So they might decide to issue shares or bonds, depending on whether they want to issue debt or equity. And again, a bank can help. And the bank can help in a number of ways with, say, a share issue. Number one, when should the company looking to raise the funds do it? There are good times, there are bad times. Depends on the market, depends on which investors the bank can find to buy these shares. Number two, how do I market and publicise this new issue? Who are we going to sell these shares to on behalf of Tesco? So the bank might do a little roadshow, go around approaching institutions such as pension funds, likely investors, on behalf of the company trying to sell the shares. And that takes a bit of time. It might prepare prospectuses to market the whole thing. Um, it might then advise on the price. It might even get involved in underwriting. It's all very well for a company to say, we want to raise X many million pounds and we want to do it within a month. But what if no one wants to buy the shares? Bit of a problem. If you're an airline and you've committed to buy a certain number of aircraft, you've got to have the funds ready. So an investment bank might take a hefty fee for committing to buy shares that other investors don't want in a new issue. And quite often the fee is a percentage of the amount raised. So you can imagine where hundreds of millions of pounds are involved, that fee gets big pretty quickly. So these two things, often an advisory role, but the underwriting element brings some risk to the investment bank, hence, in theory, the big fees that they charge. And then another big area is structuring products. Again, it's a sort of advisory role. Um, here, you get clients of the investment bank, institutional or even retail, represented by, for example, another bank, coming along and saying, we need a product. We want to sell something to the public or to institutions that does a particular job. And they'll bring in an investment bank to help them design it. So, for example, you may have come across those products at Money Week, we're not desperately keen on them, called structured products that say things like, as an investor, give us your money for two years, 
In a worst case scenario, you get your money back in two years' time. In a best case, you get your money back and 80% of the rise in the FTSE 100 over the next two years. As an investor, you might think, well, that's good. Um, so the worst thing is I get my money back in two years, and I might get my money back plus 80% of the rise in the FTSE. Now, the bank that sells you that is selling you a structured product. They've had to put together two or three different securities to make that work. And that's something that investment banks get involved in too. And just in case you're thinking, what is wrong with that product? Have a think about it. If I say to you, in a worst case scenario, you'll get your money back in two years time, that's not great. Because over the next two years, you could be earning interest on your cash for simply putting it in a bank account. So just getting it back in two years time isn't fabulous. And if you think the FTSE is going to rise over the next two years, why on earth would you only want 80% of the gain in the FTSE when you might as well take 100%? Anyway, structured products have their fans. At Money Week, we're often not amongst them. But nonetheless, investment banks are quite good at designing those products, whether ultimately the target is the retail market or the, the sort of institutional market that involves pension funds and life assurance companies. So, lots of different activities. Does it all justify the big bonuses? Frankly, very good question, which I won't attempt to address here. But nonetheless, investment banks would say these are risky activities that should command big fees to the people directly involved in them. And although investment banks do other things, and you won't always find all of them agreeing on the terminology I've used here, these are five of the biggest and most common ways that a lot of them try to make money.